Hi, I'm Ryan Carfiello, I'm the Director of Corporate Accounts at PMR. Uh, we'll be shooting a, a series of educational videos talking about catalytic converters, the industry, uh, and a lot of other things that I think a lot of recyclers um, will find useful. So the first thing is, what is a catalytic converter? A uh, catalytic converter is an emission control device on vehicles that basically lessens the toxic gases a car produces. So that's the, the goal of the catalytic converter and essentially why there's value to it is every converter has some composition of precious metals, uh, being platinum, palladium and rhodium. Today we're going to be showcasing the four different material types of catalytic converters. Uh, basically just a very brief one-on-one of catalytic converters. Um, so we're going to first start with the topic of aftermarkets. So aftermarkets are basically uh, a non-original piece that's put on a car to replace a converter that is, is not working anymore. So on the table I have a few different examples of converters and I would say there's a lot of similar tells that you can see from these. Um, aftermarkets in general are going to be much lighter. For example, you're going to see on different units that they're not going to all look the same. So some are going to have shields, some are going to have no shields. Um, you'll see this one here. It has one shield on one side, nothing on the other. So every converter is going to be different for the aftermarkets, but the main way you're going to decipher the difference uh, between an OEM and an aftermarket is really in the way it looks, the way it's welded together, and, and basically the the weight of it. So for an example, this converter is going to be very, very light. Um, even if you get a larger, larger one, it's still going to be light, but it's not going to have the same density as a OEM piece. So why it's important to talk about aftermarkets first is they're worth a lot less than an original piece. Uh, on average, there's probably 90% less precious metals in aftermarkets. Um, thus being the reason why it's worth about 90% less than a regular piece. An average aftermarket inside is only gonna have about a pound, maybe 1.2 pounds per converter of, of the biscuit, um, where an average converter, uh, being an OEM, is gonna be closer to two pounds converter inside. So you can just, you can feel the converter. Um, I would say the biggest tell is looking at it. If you see a lot of stampings, um, the date the converter was put on, the code C-A-C-E-N-A-T-A, -A -A, usually those are tells that they're going to be aftermarkets. Um, sometimes arrows, um, the word MagnaFlow is going to be another one, kind of showing here um, the date on the converter as well in an arrow. So you're going to have a vary of different looking aftermarkets. These are all uh, four aftermarkets on the table. But you're going to have ones without the shell. You're going to have one that surrounds the shell front and back. You're going to have one that only has a shell on the one side and nothing on the back side. And then, you know, another no shell uh, whatsoever. So you're going to have a, a vary of them. But you'll see just with holding the converter together, the welding lines are not clean at all. On a regular OEM, they're going to be much cleaner and much more dense. So I'm just going to give an example of the weight difference between an OEM converter on my left hand and an aftermarket on my right. Both converters are similar in size, but if you're just weighing them in your hands, this one could almost be twice the, the weight of this converter here. And you can't really see that uh, by a picture, but just holding it, um, you'll see that you'll feel that this one's a lot denser. Um, and that's really a good tell of an aftermarket. You can have an aftermarket that is twice the size of this, but if you really hold it up, give it a, a good shake, you'll notice that it's not really dense and it doesn't weigh a lot. And, and that's the, you know, one of the best ways to decipher it, other than looking at the tells that, uh, you know, I've spoke about. So now moving over to the OEM side, OEM standing for Original Equipment Manufacturer. It's the original piece that, that was basically put on the car from the car manufacturer. So you're going you're gonna to see a, a variety of different sizes. Um, you can have very, very small converters, even maybe half the size of this. Um, and you can have larger converters looking like this uh, Suzuki over here. So basically, when you're looking inside, I would say all of these are going to have a very similar um, honeycomb pattern. Um, they're going to basically 
for the most part have what we call a grid or a square pattern besides the odd uh, Chryslers and a couple other units but I would say at least 90 you know 5% plus are going to have a square um, pattern inside so it's always a good thing to check the inside of the converters you can decipher you know a foil versus you know a, a OEM ceramic converter just by looking inside it but understanding these four different types of converters are very important because it's almost impossible to just dive into converters and, and learn all your grades. You know, some people take years, you know, uh, even a decade sometimes to really understand all the different grades of converters. But the hard thing is if you're not constantly touching them every day, you know, looking and analyzing new ones coming in the, into the industry, um, you're really gonna get rusty. So it's, people say that they know converters and that's a, it's a tough thing to really understand because it's constantly evolving. So I think if you really start with the basics of an aftermarket, um, an OEM ceramic, a foil and a DPF, if you can at least start there um, and, and be able to separate and understand those material types, um, it's just gonna set up for you, you know, learning at a, at a much faster pace just because there, there's so many, you know, tens of thousands of different converters into different grades. So it does make it pretty, uh, pretty confusing, but um, yeah. So talking about OEM, um, you're gonna feel that on average, they're gonna be a lot heavier, a lot more, the word is dense, right? So you can have some, a small converter like this that just weighs a lot more, even though it's not large. Um, you can see that a lot of the welding on these converters is just much more clean versus an aftermarket. So that's a, a really good tale. And you'll notice that on some cars, you can have a branch of two converters, you can have a branch of three, even up to four converters. So every car, you know, it has a different makeup of, of the converter. Um, and a lot of companies do like to, you know, decipher foreign converters versus domestic converters. So that's another way of, of kind of looking into it. But I wouldn't say that any one category, um, let's just say it's Chrysler, it's GM, it's Ford, it's uh, you know foreign. You're always gonna have higher grade converters and lower grade converters into each category. So if you're buying catalytic converters, um, you know, you can't just go after one type. Uh, I would say there, there's gonna be highs and lows of, of each, each basically brand. So not every converter has a code on it. Um, some do, if you're living in a, a climate or a weather region that has a lot of wear and tear, uh, rough winters, you're gonna have a lot of corrosion, so you won't see it. Um, but a lot of the converters, they're basically engraved the code right on the body. And then you'll have other ones uh, like this Suzuki here that basically has it right on the shield. Um, so you're gonna find codes in really different places. Some are gonna be on the body, some are gonna be on the ridge, um, some are gonna be closer to the front or the back. So there's no consistency exactly where the code is. Um, but basically in a lot of catalogs, you can actually just type in the code and get a more specific real-time price versus what a general category would be. And I think why OEMs are really important to really understand is they're gonna make roughly 90% up of an average load. Um, you know, could be plus or minus, um, but at the end of the day, these are gonna be the bulk of your converters that have very good value. So it's really important to decipher, you know, an aftermarket versus an OEM. So the next uh, category we're gonna talk about are foils. Um, a lot of different people in the industry use different terms. Essentially, they all mean the same. So I would say the common terms are going to be foil, uh, stainless steel, wrap, or wire. Um, but essentially, they, make, they mean all the same thing. So the difference with a foil converter versus let's say a ceramic honeycomb converter is the inside is, is really going to be made of stainless steel. So you're not going to have a brick inside the converter that you can break with your hand. It's really going to be made of only dust. So that's the main difference. And I think for most people, you can kind of look at the, the shields that you'll see time and time again, you know, a standard six pound Chrysler, you're going to always have the same shield. Um, you're going to have some foreigns that have very similar styles. But at the end of the day, the most important thing is to look inside. So you'll see what's called like a spiral pattern. And the, the honeycomb inside is shaped like a spiral versus a regular unit is going to have what they call a grid or a square pattern. So that's the difference. So the number one thing when looking at foils is 
just looking at the pattern inside. And when you see that it's not square and it's basically a, a circular uh, pattern or a spiral pattern, then you know it's foil. So when it comes to foil, um, a lot of companies just decipher it in two different categories. You're gonna have your domestic foil that I have here and you're gonna have your foreign foil. Generally, the foreigns are gonna be worth more per pound and these converters are all done on a per pound basis because they're much different from their counterparts. So you can have um, foils that basically weigh one pound up to 10 pounds um, on average and you're really looking for the inside weight of the foil. So for example, we call this a 10 pound domestic, but with a little bit of piping and the shield and everything, it's gonna weigh a lot more than 10 pounds, but we're really talking about the weight of, of the material inside. So that's, the, um, that's some good points talking about foil. Um, again, a lot of companies, the old way of doing it is pricing it out in a small, medium, and large category. Small being one to three pounds, medium being roughly four to six pounds, and large being seven to 10 pounds. Um, but a lot of companies these days are doing them by weight and weight of the insides. So you're gonna have your domestics and you're gonna have your foreigns at different price points, but essentially you need to look at them on a per pound basis. So the next type of material we're gonna talk about are DPFs, which are diesel particulate filters. You can have some units that have zero value. You can have some that are worth, you know, up to or over a thousand dollars value. There's a huge range. Um, so we're gonna talk about some different ones, ones to stay away from, uh, ones to not ship. I'm not gonna get into the complexities of the system and how it works, but um, I'm gonna explain you know, what to really look out for. So a lot of companies um, don't realize the difference from some of these no value filters. So we have one here. Um, it's a common, what we call Nelson filter. So if you type in these, this code in most databases, you're gonna find that this is worth zero. And why is it worth zero? You know, looking inside, it looks just like a converter biscuit, the honeycomb, same color sometimes. So it's confusing to some people of why a converter of this size, of this weight, why it's not worth anything. So there's a couple things. You know, there could be no loadings whatsoever of uh, precious metals when that unit is getting made, or for the majority of them, they're actually gonna be worth very, very minuscule amounts. So let's just say some could be worth four, five, six dollars. At the end of the day, when you process a piece like this, when you add uh, some fees into the, uh, the assay or the um, refining, you're gonna find that it's actually gonna work out in the negative. So if you process you know, huge loads of say this unit, on average after processing fees and everything else that goes into it, the unit's actually gonna average in the negative. And that's the reason why a lot of companies put this at zero. So they really don't um, evaluate it and you don't go out there and purchase this unit. So this is an example. Uh, I would say running the codes on diesel are gonna be your best friend. Um, you know, work with a, a, a company and a database has a robust uh, number of different units. Um, you need someone that's, you know, working with tens of, you know, thousands of different numbers. Um, but again, this is a great example of a unit that you definitely don't want to ship or you don't want to process. What makes it pretty confusing is you're gonna have another unit that really is very similar in size. Um, could even be very similar in the look, but at, at the end of the day, you know, this is gonna be uh, on a different part of the diesel system and it's gonna be worth a lot more value. So again, your best friend is gonna be running the serial number, um, getting the best accurate, you know, real-time price for it. But at the end of the day, um, a lot of them don't look any different inside. So you just gotta really be careful with them just because the values uh, for diesels range so greatly. Uh, something else to mention that the last couple of years, the diesel industry has, has greatly changed. You know, five, 10 years ago, you can throw, you know, your diesel units in, mix in with your converters, didn't really cause a problem. But what's happening is the carbon content in a lot of these diesels is causing um, at the smelting level and the furnaces to really overheat and even explode. So this is a, a huge problem in the diesel industry. That's why you might see you know, branches or systems that in the past were worth huge values and, and they could be worth sometimes no value 
um, because some of these issues. So I'm going to just talk about this one Ford that you'll probably see pretty uh, pretty often. It's, it's a common unit. So generally the smaller piece in the front is going to be where all the value is. And you know, recent years analysis um, and also a lot of carbon testing, you're going to find um, there's two things. Let's say this back piece for sure is a high carbon unit. Now it doesn't matter if, if this has a hundred dollar value or zero dollar value. If it's a super high carbon content converter, it essentially is not worth anything because it cannot be processed. If this gets mixed in with some of your other good units, it could really downgrade the load or get it rejected. So in our you know, system, you can run both serial numbers and you'll find that this unit is gonna really have no carbon in it. It's gonna be high value. It's gonna be a good unit to purchase and ship. And in, in reverse, this is gonna be the unit that has high carbon and um, we're not able to process this. So you just gotta be really careful um, you can essentially ship it in together if it was attached, you know, and, and some companies will actually just plasma it off for you. But again, you just want to make sure that you're, you know what you're shipping and you're shipping the good units that are, are worth its time. So continuing to talk about carbon content, um, you'll also see in this case, you know, the, the, the units on the left were actually a branch, two converters together. It's a very similar way, but actually this is gonna be one unit with two different biscuits inside. And it's actually gonna work this exact same way. You're gonna have the front smaller biscuit here, which is gonna have all the value and it's essentially gonna have no carbon. And then the back piece, it's gonna have a lot of carbon and sometimes zero um, value whatsoever. So it's important that you know, this is something new that really just came out in the last couple of years. So a lot of companies are analyzing this unit, even analyzing the different biscuits within. So we would call this something that we call high carbon recoverable. So this unit as a whole, if it got processed, for sure it's high carbon. But if we do our job and, and assist and educate, we would basically plasma it off in half and only process the front unit which is actually gonna be worth it. And we're gonna discard or, or toss out the back piece. So, you know, you can do this yourself if you really wanted to. Um, but again, it, there's a time and a cost for you to process it and cut it in half, but just understanding which units. So imagine that's gonna change the price point if a company is analyzing this in, in current market and realizing that this piece is not worth anything and this piece is where all the value is. So that's why you might see uh, a lot of movements, uh, price points going up and down um, in, in master catalogs. In terms of processing these materials, um, for the most part in aftermarket, because it is ceramic based and as well as OEM, um, they're gonna basically be able to process in a similar fashion. Um, same thing with diesels, you know, they, they do have a ceramic based honeycomb inside. Um, when it comes to foils, that process is a little different because it's really steel inside with dust. You cannot just cut it on a regular guillotine system. Um, so those have to be processed differently. But at the end of the day, you know, you want to group your materials and process them to get data and feedback on that particular material type. So, you know, you might have an average load that is made up of 10% aftermarkets, but that swings so, so greatly. You can have the next one at 5%, the next one at 20%. So it's better to understand these converter types. Um, you might want to separate them in, in Gaylord boxes right at your facility, um, but you can also work with companies that you can mix them in a box, ship it to them, and they will count and separate the material for you. So there's different ways about it, but the biggest recommendation is to not be mixing um, all the materials together and processing them as one because the composition is so different. Um, it's harder to analyze and, and get consistency at the laboratory. So that's my biggest piece of advice is try to receive your assay for different material types. I think that covers the basics of uh, Converters 101 with the different material types being aftermarket, regular OEM, foil, and DPF. Stay tuned for more videos and educational information.